Hi there, I am Paul Belflam and this is Industrial Organization. In this presentation, I want briefly to show you how we model firms in industrial organization, the various assumptions we make about how firms behave. We're still reviewing some microeconomic notions that will prove useful for uh, this course. We insist here on costs and concepts like this economy economies or diseconomies of scale and scope and we'll briefly talk about this assumption of profit maximization. If you want some background reading uh, go to section 211 in the textbook. Right, so firms, let's put it this way, we will approximate them as purely a program of profit maximization. Okay, so Basically, we want to look within the firm. We will put all the relationships within the firm into a black box that we will not really open. The reason is the following. The course and industrial organization in general is focused on the relationship among firms, the strategic interaction on markets with a limited number of firms. As we will see throughout the course, this is quite a complex um, situation to model and to analyze. Okay, so if we want to keep the problem tractable, uh, we don't want to consider different sources of complexities at the same time. So because we focus on the relationships among firms, we tend to abstract away or to simplify a lot the relationships within the firm. Okay, and so as we will discuss, we make this very uh, strong assumption that everyone within the firm, from the workers till the, uh, up to the shareholders, they all share this same objective, which is to maximize profit. Okay? Of course, this is an approximation which is quite useful uh, to uh, analyze what we want to and which is realistic mainly for big companies, but there are many reasons to also think that this assumption is not the most realistic for other situations and we will briefly discuss this uh, later in other videos um, when we will uh, put the assumption of profit maximization into perspective and I will invite you to watch a video on social entrepreneurship for example uh, where entrepreneurs have different objectives potentially than pure profit maximization and I will also invite you to watch a video on the what is called the principal agent model that somehow explains how the objective within the firms can be aligned or not and what kind of uh, policy can be applied within the company to try and make sure that different uh, stakeholders will have um, the same kind of objectives. Okay, but for now we take this approximation. Firms are seen as a program of profit maximization. Profit is the difference between revenues and costs. The revenues, we'll have to discuss them later because they depend on the consumer's preferences and uh, this is something uh, which is related of course to the determination of demand as we discussed in another video. Okay, And the cost, this is what we want to present here, they depend on the firm's technology. Okay, so let's look at the costs. Now, first thing to remember is that when we talk about costs in economics, and especially when we think of uh, firms making decisions, the costs that matter are the opportunity costs. Okay, so we need to think about what we are renouncing to when we want to evaluate the costs. And for that reason, the history costs or the cost of the factors are not the relevant costs. Okay, uh, let me take an example. So here, suppose that a firm wants to uh, launch a new product, for example, or decide to produce a new product using some existing scarce capacity. Okay, the question is, what is the cost which is relevant for the firm to make this decision whether to produce or not? Well, the relevant economic costs have to include the profits that the firm could make if it was using this scarce capacity for the next best alternative use. Okay, so basically, what kind of profit are you renouncing to 
if you don't use the, this capacity to produce the new product, but to do what, what is the next uh, best alternative use. Okay, so keep that in mind. When you talk about costs, we think of opportunity costs, which are not the same as the cost that an accountant would actually write in the books. Okay, now the, the best, well, sorry, the, 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 the first approach of cost is the cost function, C of Q, that tells you what is the minimal cost to produce some output Q, Q given the input prices and the production technology. Okay. Now, moving from there, a very useful concept is the marginal cost. Okay. C prime of Q, that's the first derivative of the cost with respect to Q. It tells you by how much the total cost increases if you want to produce one more unit of the quantity. Okay. And throughout the course, we will often, in the examples and exercises that we make, we will take this uh, marginal cost as a constant. So each additional unit of output costs at the margin uh, exactly the same. This is a simplifying assumption. In reality, the marginal cost is often increasing with the quantity. Now, if the total cost is, can be decomposed into a fixed cost, which is something you pay uh, whatever the quantity you produce, plus a constant marginal cost, then we have what is called economies of scale, which I will now define on the next slide. Okay. To, to explain what economies of scale or diseconomies of scale are, we need another concept, which is the concept of average cost. This is the total cost divided by the quantity produced. This is also called the unit cost, the cost per unit produced. Okay. Now, if this average cost is decreasing for, for some range of quantity, then we say that there are economies of scale. The more you produce, the lower the average cost. Okay. That favors a concentrated industry. What does that mean? Well, if by producing more you reduce your average cost, it means that it pays to be larger. So a larger company will have a lower average cost, okay? which gives, of course, an advantage over competitors, smaller competitors. Okay? And so if you think of how the industry is going to evolve, if there are economies of scale, it's quite likely that only big firms will survive, meaning that a few of them will be on the market and this is what we mean by a concentrated industry. Okay? Now, the, the opposite happens if you've got diseconomies of scale. That would be the case where the average cost is increasing if you increase the quantity. Okay? So here on this graph, you've got the two possibilities. The average cost as a, as a form of U. In the decreasing part, you've got economies of scale. The average cost decreases as quantity increases. And in the second part, if quantity increases, you've got the average cost increasing. This is the case of these economies of scale. Okay. Now, another concept is economies of scope. Here, we refer to situations where one firm is producing several products, and we link the average cost of one particular product to the quantity produced of the other products. Okay, so if when you increase the product range, if you produce more of other products, you decrease the average cost of one particular product, then you would say that there are economies of scope or diseconomies of scope if it was increasing instead of decreasing. Right? Last concept, the concept of fixed costs. I already alluded to this concept. Fixed costs are independent of the current output levels. Typically, you pay the fixed cost even before producing, okay? They're independent of how much you produce. They affect the profit level, of course, but they don't affect your decisions. Okay, the decisions will depend on the marginal cost, okay? Um, you don't look behind when you make a decision. The fixed costs are gone, okay? Are bygones. Now, the sunk cost is the part of the fixed cost which you will never recover. Okay? Even if you were stopping your activity and selling uh, whatever stock or machine you have, well, part of what you sell, or, you, or let's put it in other words, you will receive a lower value than what you paid to acquire these um, assets in the first place. And the difference is what we call the same cost. These are the part of the fixed cost that you cannot recover. Okay, so... Here comes the, now the profit maximization, maximization hypothesis. 
okay, which we will of course develop further in the course. The profit is traditionally written in this way. We use the Greek letter pi to represent the profit. The profit of a firm is the difference between total revenue and total costs, okay, the economic opportunity cost of the firm, the total cost, and q uh, times p of q, these are the revenues, p of q being the inverse demand of the firm. Okay, um, we focus here on the firm's own quantity. For now, we ignore other variables, which are other decisions that the firm can make, like how much to advertise, what kind of effort to make in research and development. It doesn't mean that we are not going to analyze these um, variables, but we will do this uh, step by step and consider first the short-term decision, like choosing the quantity, and then the long-term decisions like advertising or R&D. Okay? Of course, and this is the core of this whole course on industrial organization, in market context, in imperfectly competitive markets, the decision of one firm is affected by the decision of other firms. Okay? Typically, the price here that one firm will receive will depend on its, on its own quantity, but also on the quantities of other firms. Okay. Now, as I said in the introduction, firms are assumed to be pro to be profit maximizers. This is a fairly good approximation for uh, the objective of the owners of the firm. Okay. But as we discussed in other uh, videos, other objectives could be pursued. It's also the profit maximizing assumption is a reasonable assumption for uh, very large companies. Um, because the shareholders uh, will want to maximize the profits and so the value of the firm they own. But many firms are not owner managed, okay, and there may be a discrepancy between what the shareholders want and what the manager wants. Okay, and then uh, comes the question of how the objectives of several uh, parties within the firm are aligned or not. Okay, and again, I refer you to another video about the principal agent model to shed some light on this issue. That's it for now. Goodbye.